this case, shall I? I can poke him in with the sword myself, and then he'll pull out this little. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to? Oh, I can bring it to. I don't know. I need to do so. Yeah, I will put my on. Okay. My knee a bit there. I just encourage him to actually hop, uh, turn it on. <gasps> Oh yeah, good, good. You're right. Okay, excellent. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. This is CFRG at IETF 118 in Prague. So I hope you're in the right room. Um, we have pretty packed agenda, so let's get started. So I'm Alexei Melnikov, Nick Sullivan sitting next to me. Stanislav Smyshlaev is remote. So, as usual, this session is being recorded. Um, if you're on site, either use on site tool or full client, um, because this is how we know how many people attended the session. So, we'll have minutes. Thank you, Russ. How's it for? taking some notes for us. Um, I hope by this time in the ITF meeting, you've seen the note well. So this covers uh, IPR rules as well as um, behavior policy. In our RTF. So um, we do a uh, fairly big number of documents and flights, but actually there were quite a few changes. So let's just quickly review them. Oh, sorry. First agenda. Any agenda bashing? Okay. Uh, So we actually have, uh, by my count, four RFCs published since last uh, IETF meeting, which is probably uh, our CFRG record. Um, and thank you especially Stanislav for shepherding at least three, maybe even four of these documents. So that was quite, quite an effort. Um, we have a couple of documents in RFC Editor's queue actually in all 48. So just about to be published. We have one document Frost in ISG review. Uh, at the moment, we are not waiting for IRTF chair for anything. 
but I'm sure this will change soon. Um, here's the list of various um, active documents. Um, as you can see, uh, a lot of them got updated, so this is all pretty active. Um, we got one document by Nick on guidelines for writing cryptography specification um, that was posted shortly after last ATF. Um, and we do have a few expired documents. Uh, the one in bold are the documents actually which are supposed to be an active work, but what expired recently. So I just wanted to highlight that. And with that, I think, okay, I'm going to, okay. Chris, please come on. Yeah, up here and then tell me when to uh, move slides. Good afternoon, everybody, slash good morning, slash evening. Um, so uh, this is uh, a not a lot of uh, new things recently, um, but this is a document that's been steadily moving along. The editors think it's pretty close to being ready for research group last call. And um, so I want to give everyone just a kind of a, a narrative of the development of this draft and um, talk briefly about what is left to do. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, VDAF uh, is, a, is a verifiable distributed aggregation function. So this is a particular class of, of multi-party computation protocols that are based on secret sharing. Um, this is a primitive that's of interest to the PPM working group. Basically, at a high level, our goal is we have a bunch of measurements generated by clients, and we want to compute some function over, over those measurements without revealing to any of the parties involved in the computation um, what the measurements are. So um, each VDAF has a kind of the same architecture, which is shown on the, the right side of the screen here. Um, each client takes its measurement, it secret shares its measurement into input shares, sends one of these to each of um, multiple aggregators, generally just two. Uh, these, are, these are the servers doing kind of the bulk of the computation. The aggregators interact with, an, with, uh, with one another in order to, uh, basically you wanna know that the secret shared data is data you can safely consume. Um, so um, this requires interaction and that's what the kind of arrow between the two aggregators shows. Finally, each aggregator kind of adds up its input shares locally, computes this thing called the aggregate share, sends this to a data collector who then just um, kind of adds the aggregate shares together to get the final result of the protocol. So uh, we have two security properties we want for this kind of construction. We want privacy, basically uh, in the presence of a malicious collector and all but one aggregator. We wanna make sure that no uh, honest client's measurement is revealed. Um, and all they learn, in fact, is the aggregate result. And then we also want robustness, which is basically in the presence of malicious clients who might be trying to, uh, tr to upload junk data. Uh, we can detect any malformed inputs and, and remove them from the input set. Okay, so that's a high level overview of kind of VDAFs and our security goals. Um, as what we set out to do with this draft is to not only specify this, this abstraction and the goal, but also to specify two constructions. We've done so, uh, the first is called Prio 3. This is like a, the, this is kind of the basic tool that we have in our toolbox. It gets input validity from this thing called a fully linear proof. Basically, this is a zero knowledge proof system that you can evaluate on secret shared data instead of like committed or encrypted data as usual. There's lots of variants of Prio 3 that are specified in the draft. Um, each of them is kind of suitable for a different use case. And we have built 
this to be very flexible. So there's uh, lots of different variants you can imagine for this. Uh, and in fact, there are unspecified variants that are not in the draft, but um, uh, we're using for different use cases. The other construction is called Poplar. Uh, this is uh, a, a VDAF that's intended to solve the heavy hitters problem. There you have a set of like bit strings uploaded by clients, imagine like URLs, and you want to count uh, the, the ones that are most frequently occurring. Um, say, for example, you want to know how many people visited, uh, like, like what, what is a set of, of websites visited uh, by at least um, T users um, in, a, in a day for some threshold T. This is based on a, um, a function secret sharing scheme called an IDPF, incremental distributed point function. So that's basically our two core kind of primitives uh, that we use in this space, IDPFs and FLPs. Um, other MPC techniques are possible, and we've sort of intentionally left room for um, schemes requiring multiple rounds. Um, generally speaking, like we are constraining the architecture of MPC in a way that doesn't give us all of MPC, but we think gives us a sufficiently large set of possibilities to address um, the use cases that are coming up in the PPM working group. Okay. Um, so our first draft, we adopted this, I think, I forget now, it's like 2022. Um, our first feature complete draft, the one that spelled out Prio 3 and Poplar in full detail uh, was draft two. Um, these are based on papers from the literature. Uh, so uh, Prio is, is, I think, well known amongst a lot of people. So it's based on the original paper, but we included some optimizations that appeared in a, in a later paper. And then um, Poplar is this thing that appeared later at IEEE S&P 2021. And you can see here, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of the same set of authors. So people are probably familiar with uh, Henry Corgan Gibbs and Friends, and they're sort of the ones who are making all this happen. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, Henry took a look at draft two uh, and provided some feedback. Uh, one thing we found at this time was a bug um, that would have amounted to an attack against robustness. This is uh, before we had formal analysis of this part of the protocol. Um, and also at this stage, we introduced code points for to distinguish different VDAFs, which is helpful for um, uh, proving stronger bounds. Next slide. Um, you're, you're on top of it, Nick. I love it. Um, uh, draft three, uh, we actually wrote a paper to do some, uh, to kind of formalize our security goals um, and try to prove security. Uh, so we found this led to lots of different robustness improvements, also kind of additional uh, considerations around um, the kind of functional part of function secret sharing. Um, we also adopted uh, C Shake 128. I will not tell you what we were doing before. It was pretty ugly. Uh, but what we found in this analysis is we needed a random oracle model, uh, needed the random oracle model, and this is how we chose to instantiate the random oracle. Uh, note that we didn't do a direct proof for Poplar 1. We were looking at kind of a related scheme that turned out to not be very interesting, but we learned a lot uh, in the attempt to um, study it. Uh, and then we also had an implementation of Poplar 1 from David Cook, who uh, then, uh, you know, it was great, and uh, he joined us as a co-editor of the draft. Uh, and from that, we got, like, some additional implementation guidance, and also, um, you know, we thought through how we want to make it constant time. I'm not 100% confident about this part of the construction. Um, and then the next draft, uh, Philip, uh, one of the co-editors, uh, reached out to a colleague uh, uh, named Xiao Wang, who provided some feedback on um, how we might optimize the IDPF. And the central kind of uh, observation is that we don't need a random oracle for this for 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 the privacy of this construction. So um, we dumped C Shake and uh, replaced it with a fixed key mode of AES based on the paper cited here. Uh, the next draft, uh, we got some feedback from actual like users, uh, uh, so that was great. Um, in this, we ended up streamlining kind of the in interface between VDAP and DAP. DAP is the uh, protocol that PPM is standardizing. This is sort of the deployment pipeline we're envisioning right now for this class of protocols. And we also did a lot of editorial work at, at this draft and also changed one of our um, Prio 3 variants to just be more useful for the use cases that we had. Next, yep. 
Um, and then uh, we got some more feedback uh, from implementers about like, well, C Shake's a weird choice, so we moved to Shake. Uh, this makes it easier to implement because this is more way more common among uh, libraries that implement SHA-3. We also defined a new VDAF. This was based on an observation about that David made about how to construct the validity circuit for the, the proof system uh, in a way that was much more efficient. And then we applied the same optimization to Prio 3 histogram. And then we also uh, uh, handled, uh, addressed more editorial things from, from Wood. Um, and then uh, after we implemented sort of this interface between DAP and VDAF, we found some bugs that we fixed uh, in this draft as well. Cool, um, so we're at draft seven. Um, we are going to take some additional features in the next draft. One is one more optimization to IDPF, um, for which we are sacrificing a little bit of security. So this is uh, something that we need to, uh, I think, study a little in a little bit more detail to make sure is, is safe. We've also added a feature to Prio 3, which is pretty safe. Um, basically, uh, what this is meant to do is allow one to trade off communication costs for CPU time. And the idea is that you kind of generate multiple proofs and um, by checking all of the, checking each of the proofs separately, independently, um, you can go with a much smaller field size and this, uh, this lets you kind of shrink how much uh, data you put on the wire. Um, yeah, what, kind of the open question here we're looking at right now is, um, you know, we need we need to provide some guide, guidance on like how how to how to do this trade off in a way that actually is is secure. Um, and I think we're still thinking through this right now. But I think we're confident that we want this feature. At least this was requested from a particular group of people, um, and uh, Henry had suggested it early on. So we thought, yeah, let's do it. Um, we're considering a few more breaking changes. Um, the one we're definitely gonna do, uh, issue 299, we are replacing Shake with TurboShake. Uh, so this is in a, in a draft going on through the CFRG right now. Um, the, the motivation here is um, CPU, cutting down CPU time. This is significantly faster for Prio 3, um, at least for certain variants. Um, uh, let's see. And then, yeah, we're, we're kind of nitpicking how we want our circuits to work to make them a little bit more flexible. Um, the kind of the big open, the, the one that I don't understand, given my lack of experience with uh, IRTF and IETF stuff, is the IANA considerations. Basically, we have uh, code points. We need to write them down somewhere. Uh, we got to figure out how this works. And then finally, uh, we have lots, all, most of the open issues right now are editorial. We have tons of works to do here. Um, before I think we're ready for uh, uh, the, the a consensus call. Um, and also, I'm, you know, we want to reach out to individual people um, to, to do reviews. We still have one implementation. If someone is like interested in this work, are interested in contributing to CFRG in some way, and you want to do an implementation that's not Rust, um, uh, yeah, like, let, let's do it. <laughs> Um, I think that's it. Anybody questions in the room? Queue online. All right, Simon. Hey, Simon. Hey, Simon Free Program, Mozilla. I'm um, just wondering, there is not a lot of mention of Poplar here, and it doesn't seem as well baked as Prio. And yeah, it's still in the VDAF draft, right? So does it stay? Does it? get removed, does it get replaced by Mastic? Yeah, I, we'll hear about Mastic in a little, in a little while. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion. I think Poplar is pretty well baked. It's not, I don't think it's as well baked as Prio, you're right, but um, um, it, could, it could potentially stay. And general question, there was talk at some point about things needing multiple implementations for standardization, is that not a requirement? I wouldn't, I don't know if that's a requirement. I would doubt that's a requirement, but um, we, it's one way to make sure, it's, it's one way to review something and make sure you understand it and make sure uh, we get the feedback that we need. So independent implementations will make the spec better. Okay. Thanks. Chris, thank you.
All right, Vasilis. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So, hello, everyone. Um, Vasilis, when you talk about uh, the PPS signals here. And next. So, uh, just a quick recap what PPS signals do. PPS signals is just a digital signature algorithm that supports deterministic constant size digital signatures over um, a vector of multiple messages. They all support what we call unlinkable proofs that are essentially zero knowledge proofs of knowledge of a signature. And those proofs also support uh, select disclosure of messages, which essentially means that a prover during proof generation, they can choose to disclose some of the signed messages, but not others. And next. Yes, so uh, we're going to go through what we've changed in the latest draft, mainly made editorial updates. Uh, so no breaking changes in this version. Uh, there will likely be at least one breaking change in the next version, however, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But in this version, uh, the main things we've done is to restructure the, uh, the draft to, first of all, separate the proof operations to different subroutines and to separate the main operations into a high level API uh, operation and a core operation. And next. So, uh, while we've changed the proof generation to be different subroutines, um, well, this is just to make combining the PPS proof with other zero knowledge proof protocols are uh, easier. So for example, if you want to use something like pseudonyms, if you want to combine the PPS proof with um, a membership proof of, or a non-membership proof for evocation, maybe with accumulator, stuff like that, uh, this change makes it way more easier to do so. So what we essentially done is instead of having one proof generation procedure, we now have three subroutines that run in sequence, proof initialization, a challenge calculation, and then a proof analyzation. The result of the proof analyzation is a final proof that you take. Uh, next. The other change we've done is we've, uh, we added this concept of an interface operation, which we call uh, a core operation. Um, so essentially what we previously had is that the all the operations, the main BPS operations, so sign, verify, proof generation, and proof verification, they needed uh, a way to calculate a set of points that we call the generators in the draft, and also a way to process the messages, the input messages to map them into scalar values. Now for flexibility, those procedures were defined as part of the cipher sheet. However, we found that a lot of um, applications required more flexibility than that. We had some applications, for example, that want to use predicate proofs, and you know, for those to work, they would have to define even multiple cipher sheets as part of just one protocol. So what we've done is we've removed those operations um, from the cipher suite, and we created what we call the core operations, like cosine, for example, that expects the set of generators and the messages already mapped into scalars as input. And then the interface operation essentially will create those generators, will process the messages, and then will pass them to the core operation. So this adds a necessary flexibility. Next. Okay, so what we are working on right now, um, and what will likely be in the next draft, is a new proof generation procedure. Next. Uh, so to give a bit of context of why we think a new proof generation procedure is needed, which will be a breaking change, um, essentially, what we originally used in the draft was this work from around 2016 and 2017. There was a series of work that presented proof of knowledge protocols, efficient proof of knowledge protocols for DBS signatures that had this, uh, the format of A, E, and S. So a point with two scalars. Um, the interesting part there was that it was really not apparent to anyone what this last scalar, uh, the value S of the signature was providing, both when it comes to security and when it comes to features, where the main assumption was that it was just a remnant of old work that this author have done that kind of led to the BPS work. 
And to kind of back up this hypothesis in this year's Eurocrypt, there was this paper that got presented that proved the strong affordability property for PPS signatures that don't have the search value. So PPS signatures of the form A and T, so just a point and a scalar. Uh, now this paper did also present a proof of knowledge protocol that became essentially what we used in the draft. Uh, a slight alteration actually of that protocol, of that protocol for just some practical reasons. The, the issue now with that is that in almost a month ago, some cryptographers that were reviewing our draft brought to our attention that it's not really that straightforward to prove the soundness property of that zero of that proof of knowledge uh, Essentially, what you have to do is to reduce uh, the soundness property to the two strong Diffie-Hellman assumption. The issue with that is, first of all, it's, that argument was not that straightforward. Uh, and it's not really the standard thing that most, you know, proof of knowledge protocols do. So it become harder or let's say unclear how to combine PPS with other proof of knowledge protocols or how to use PPS as a black box as part of other protocols and stuff like that. So what we do, uh, what we're going to do for the next version is uh, to use this proof of knowledge protocol uh, that is a small alteration from the HTL16 one, the one presented uh, in that work. Um, just a very small alteration of that protocol to work with uh, signatures in the form uh, presented in the 2023 paper. So we're going to use those signatures of just a point of the scalar, but with the proof knowledge protocol from 2016. Uh, we have an open PR now with that protocol for the draft. We ask a couple of cryptographers to review it, and they have done. We got positive feedback by all of them. We have also talked with the authors of the 2023 paper, uh, and they will be updating their paper to add that protocol there as well. And I am also aware of at least two implementations uh, for that new protocol that has updated to this new protocol. And uh, just yesterday, I think we got feedback that the test vectors we have in the APR uh, got validated by one of, the, one of those implementations. So we will be likely merging this PR very soon. And after that, uh, we think we will be very close to asking for a review or cryptographic review by the working group. Uh, next, thank you. Uh, so uh, another thing that we are working on are uh, blind BBS uh, signatures. Next. So BBS signatures can also support uh, the blind issuance optionality. So this works, as you can imagine, the prover, first of all, commits into a vector of messages that they want to get a signature on. They create a proof of correctness of this commitment. They send both the commitment and the proof to the issuer. The issuer will verify the proof. And if it verifies, they will sign, uh, they will create a signature using this commitment, maybe also adding messages that they want to include to the proof and send that signature back to uh, the prover. Uh, the prover. Now, this is just a valid PPS signature, so messages that the prover committed and messages that they should commit. And so you can just use it to create uh, regular PPS proofs uh, as normal. Uh, so some characteristics of this, uh, of this protocol is, first of all, one thing I think is that you don't really need to have any unblinding step uh, as in many, you know, uh, blind signatures protocols. Uh, essentially, the randomness that the prover used to blind the commitment it just becomes one of the signed messages uh, that will never be revealed, obviously. Uh, now, we have heard by a lot of people that they have used cases for the stuff, like user binding, for example, where the user will commit to a secret key that they would then need to know in order to be able to generate proofs. Uh, stuff like if you use pseudonyms, you can use blind signatures so the issuer cannot trap your pseudonym, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and for that reason, we started working on the draft for uh, an, an extension document rather that will extend the core PPS functionality with this additional uh, blind signature functionality. 
And the question we're going to ask by the group is that, should this be a separate document or should we add this functionality to the main document? And our opinion right now is for that to be a separate document, mainly because the main document is not that small uh, already. So we don't want to add you know, more stuff and make it bigger and harder for people to read. Uh, but we have heard arguments for the other way around, have one document for consistency. So um, if people have an opinion on that, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, and next. Yep, never necessary references, and that's it. Thank you very much. I would be more than happy to take any questions. Any questions or opinions about the blind signature part of this draft? All right, Christopher. Thanks for the update and uh, thanks for presenting this. Um, do we have a specific use case uh, in mind for uh, blind BBS signatures in the IETF or outside? Uh, in the IETF, there has been some discussions on using this for privacy paths. So essentially the the user will get a challenge by some reliant party or an origin as it's called for that group. And they will want to get a signature that is bound to this challenge without revealing this challenge to the issue. So you can use blind signatures for that. Now this is just discussion at this point. Uh, outside the ITF, as I said, yeah, there is the uh, the main use case is for user binding, binding the, the proof to a secret key known only by the user in a way that if you don't know the secret key, you cannot generate proof. So the idea um, is. For, for, for privacy pass in particular, what's the difference between this and uh, just RSA blind signatures? Like what's the thing you get? Uh, the main difference is that you can generate multiple DPS proofs that are unlitable to my knowledge. And if people from private space are here, they may have more information about that. But from the perspective of just a cryptography, I think that's a main difference. You don't need to tokenize, let's say, to have multiple, the ability to have multiple presentations of that. OK, thanks. Or you still. All right, Ori Steele. Um, so use cases within the IETF, uh, there's an application of this in the JSON web proof work in the HOSI working group. It's an application of it to privacy pass, as, as was just mentioned, you know, potentially some you know, better performance or smaller proof sizes, but for a similar sort of uh, building block. Um, and in general, this is useful for building anonymous credential systems. And there was the spice buff, uh, you know, uh, earlier this week. Um, so I think it's a, a generically a generic building block. It's very useful uh, to the question of uh, whether or not it should be two separate documents. If the existing document without the blinding is already long and stable to the point where you you can do a clean cut and it really is going to be safe to sh ship it and not touch it. And the blinding part won't need to come back and make changes to it, split them up. And, and ship the regular version. And if not, if you still need to be able to touch both sides, keep them together. I don't know what state it's actually in. Thanks. Thank you. Clea. <clears throat> Clea, just to compliment what, ah, moving mics, what Ori was saying, um, the blinded secret from the holder to the issuer and being able to present it to the verifier is really essential for a lot of the credentialing work, including the EIDAS work in the EU, where right now the only option is to reissue credentials many, many times so that you have different signatures you're sharing with each verifier. And this is a pathway forward to support issuers being issue, able to issue one credential and that the holder can make sure their presentations have different signatures across the range of verifiers they share it with. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, we're already over and we've closed the queue for, oh no, wait, we're gonna do it? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, we can keep um, questions, follow-ups on the list. Okay, Andre. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Bashko, and uh, I will give an update on AED properties draft. Uh, I will try to be very brief since we are having another uh, really exciting AED talk right after me. So, next slide, please. Uh, well, well, news. Um, uh, a new version was published like uh, two weeks ago, I guess. Um, there, uh, there are some new properties added, some new examples of functional applications. Well, uh, as usual, one of the most interesting things is uh, probably a separation of commitment property into two properties, into full commitment and key commitment. Uh, they, uh, surprisingly to me, had uh, different applications. Uh, it is a rather interesting topic, uh, a rather interesting topic. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Samuel Lucas for pointing, uh, for noticing that uh, the draft only covered uh, key commitment before and well, for providing me like, a roadmap uh, through that uh, rather <clears throat> interesting topic of commitment. Uh, well, next slide, please. Uh, yes, um, speaking about uh, properties, uh, the most requested one is probably indifferentiability. Uh, I'm asked to, to add it like after every uh, ETF talk, and well, I remember about it. I'm uh, working on it, but uh, there is a small problem uh, that uh, indifferentiability is not actually like uh, an additional security property or like an additional implementation property. It is uh, entirely different uh, new approach to defining AED security. It is, well, uh, I love indifferentiability and I really want to add, um, add it in the draft, but uh, I can't uh, find uh, approach to it uh, yet and I'll try to do it uh, in the next version. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, another thing I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, NIST workshop on the box cipher modes of operation. Uh, we have uh, many topics for discussions uh, for discussion there, and uh, there were some really great talks. Uh, I wasn't there personally, but uh, all uh, all recordings of both days are available uh, at the NIST website. Uh, there are some really interesting talks. Some really interesting papers and uh, well, uh, one of the topics uh, which was discussed uh, at the workshop was uh, additional security features. Uh, next slide please. Uh, and uh, well, at least seven of uh, 14 accepted papers uh, were about, uh, in some way, were about uh, additional uh, additional properties uh, or even like redefining uh, the standard properties uh, and extending them. Uh, and next slide. Uh, uh, and three of these uh, for, uh, related to commitment, uh, like it is probably the most demanded property at the moment. And the next slide. Yes, and at least one uh, paper cites the draft. I couldn't help uh, but notice it. It was uh, really motivating. Oh, yes. uh, and uh, finally, think uh, uh, the thing uh, which is why I give this talk every ETF meeting. It is advertisement. Uh, please contact me. Feel free to contact me if there is a property which you want to see in the draft. Uh, if there is some uh, application or protocol or which requires some AD with additional properties, or you just want to have a chat about AD and uh, you have questions about draft, uh, I will be really happy to answer you. And it proved to be very helpful for the development of the draft. Uh, 
So that's all. Uh, I can answer your questions. Uh, hi, Jonathan Lennox. We um, back in April there was we had a brief exchange on the CFRG list about um, the property that you, sometimes it's useful to have just verification without decryption because you know the use case I had was you can tell from the AAD that I don't care about this encrypted data and you mentioned you'd put it in the draft but you haven't so I just wanted to remind you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it is also on the to-do list and uh, I just uh, couldn't figure it out yet. Yes, I'm remembering about it. Chris. Yeah, I think, I think this, yeah, I think I said this before, like this is, I think gonna turn out to be really important work because like I've had a lot of conversations at IETF like still about like confusion about what AAD is supposed to do. Um, I think I was also one of the people who was like, hey, check out indifferentiable AE. Um, I don't think there's a need to put it in the draft if you don't think it fits, because you're right, it's a totally different paradigm. Um, I just thought, yeah, it might be interesting. Uh, um, one question about the draft. Do you think, uh, so there's, I was noticing that there's like lots of different properties that might like uh, there might be like implications between various properties. So for example, full uh, commitment implies key commitment. Yeah. Do, do you think it's worth, first of all, describing the relations in the draft? Second question, does it make sense to just talk about full commitment and not key commitment? Like, like is it better to provide less choices? Uh. I think, uh, well, uh, to the first question, uh, I think uh, it might be useful because um, it might be useful to note uh, different uh, relations between properties because, uh, well, uh, sometimes, well, I think more importantly is to uh, notice like uh, that some property uh, is, uh, it can be achieved together with our property. I think this is like more useful, of course, uh, just with a full commitment and key commitment, it was uh, very straightforward for that one applies each other, so I put it in the draft. Uh, and uh, as to the second question, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, to be honest, because uh, well, it is like with uh, nonce misuse. Uh, like you can have uh, nonce misuse resilience or nonce misuse resistance. Uh, sometimes you need only one of these two, and probably it is something like that. When you, if you want to, uh, as far as I understand, full commitment uh, is a little bit more difficult to achieve than key commitment. Uh, so probably there are some applications uh, where it might be important. Uh, uh, like uh, for PAC, uh, PA key, uh, you only need uh, key commitment and full commitment is just more difficult. Yeah, so I, I think it might be useful to think about who the users are. Yes. Like, um, <laughs> it's probably better to give non-cryptographers less choices. Uh -huh. um, and that's sort of one of the purposes of CFRG to my mind is uh, providing like the useful useful things for for, for, for implementers. Um, as an implementer, I think I would like to not have to think about which of these properties I need. And just, if there's an AEAD that's fast enough for, and that achieves full commitment, then that's the one I would reach for. So uh, something to think about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, that's very interesting. Thank you. All right, Alex. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alex, and I'm going to talk to you about some research I did with my co-authors earlier this year on uh, the impact of subtle AAD differences in protocol security and especially in analyzing protocols. And uh, before I go into, like, to talk about AADs, um, because I think some of you might be unfamiliar with it, I will start with some slides on uh, automated security protocol analysis. Yeah, so 
on a very high level, what we want to do, we want to analyze protocols to prove them secure, while also discovering like attacks on protocols, which then helps in the process to actually get secure communication. And traditionally, like uh, people, when, when also in the beginning, when analyzing protocols, you would uh, use like a manual effort doing cryptographic computational proofs of the protocol, trying to figure out what properties to prove and building frameworks to prove them. While this is still used today for some, like especially bigger classes of protocols, this can be a, like a really big challenge uh, as like uh, having a, a proof, uh, a manual proof in, in a scale of like TLS analysis can be very hard. So our research focuses mostly on the automated analysis of protocols, which started in the 90s and had a like, big technical progress in the recent years. Um, so we are, were able to actually analyze large protocols, um, also mostly automatic, like, uh, like helping in TLS or EMV uh, analysis. And in our group, we mainly use the so-called Tamarind prover which is one of, of many tools uh, to do so. Next slide. So I will give you a short overview about the Temer Improver, which is uh, a theory improver uh, taking a system, which is a model of the protocol, and the actual properties we want to prove about this protocol. Next slide. Um, it internally will transform these properties in the system into constraints, and together with some attacker model, um, and an internal dedicated constraint solver, it will give us, next slide, either uh, like a solution which is an attack on the protocol, on the properties we defined before, and it will visually show us like uh, how, to, how this attack can happen in our model, or we will get a proof, uh, or in the worst case, run out of memory uh, because the problem is very hard to solve. In that case, Tamarin allows us to check the interactive mode uh, with which we can inspect like the proof and then like assist the tool and with for example invariance to then again improve the system and find attacks or get a proof. So this uh, model is also not perfect. Otherwise we would only use these kind of tools to, to prove our protocol secure. So one <laughs> Like big limitation we had for years was that the attacker model uh, we used uh, assumes cryptographic primitives to be perfect. So like having symmetric encryption, hash functions, signatures without any flaws, which in practice we know this does not work. So for example, like having collisions of hash functions or like reusing nonces in AADs are problems we face, but that were not covered in, in this kind of analysis. And our research focused today on like actually finding a better way to model AADs um, such that we can capture non reuse attacks, but also more. Next slide. So yeah, we want better models for automated analysis. But why was this a problem? Uh, why was this a problem? What you see here are just a bunch of papers which define properties for AADs. And these are only a few. These are only like academic papers. So and there are way more definitions and properties out there. And some even like competing and defining really like similar things. So that also opens up for like protocol designers a lot of ways to misuse and misunderstand AADs when actually using them in practice. What our, our approach to this was now to first collect these definitions and these properties and also the constructions that were used in practice and then find also all the, or like the known attacks that used AADs to attack like uh, properties on a protocol level. Uh, and when we gathered them, we next try to find the relations between the properties we gathered and also proved missing ones if possible. Uh, we then classified the known attack vectors we found into several uh, groups before then modeling them in, in a symbolic way, in our Tamarind prover, 
uh, to conduct some case studies uh, automatically. Next slide. So what we identified uh, were that most practical allow, uh, attacks we could capture with three classes of properties. Properties on integrity and privacy, collision resistance, which uh, we defined uh, here as also like encompassing like attacks like key commitment um, and a non-smith non use. We then uh, checked uh, actual concrete AAD implementations uh, or schemes, um, whether they fulfill these properties or if there are some attacks on them. Um, yeah. Uh, when we modeled these classes, we also like so. Okay, they are not these three classes are enough in theory, but in practice, people also use AADs in a weird way. For example, splitting decryption and uh, verification of an AAD can lead to potential attacks or using tag attacks of, of certain AAD schemes in weird ways. So we actually modeled them as well. And for all of these, we then modeled a lot of variants such that we can capture also more fine-grained attacks uh, in our uh, analysis. Next slide. We then had uh, started to anal analyze our case studies in uh, two approaches. A targeted approach, which we use to find attacks in actual schemes, and a preemptive approach, which we then, like, in the future want to use to, in, during a design phase of a protocol, to figure out what kind of AAD properties we actually want to have for a certain protocol. Next, uh, next slide. In a targeted approach, we can then, for example, use like the table I showed you before to figure out uh, what kind of scheme does the protocol use in its um, design. From this, we then choose the right models in, in the Temer Improver, model the protocol, and uh, we can then either show that the protocol uh, is not vulnerable or we find uh, attacks on the protocol. Um, in the preemptive approach, we want to run all the different AAD models we built in all variations against a, a protocol model and check for the minimal, like the, the uh, weakest threat models that lead to potential attacks and the strongest attack models under which the uh, protocol remains secure to then using these two um, uh, lines to figure out what properties does the protocol actually rely on. Next slide. To test our uh, to test our approach, we then checked for like uh, protocols that were actually vulnerable uh, vulnerable to such um, attacks based on EA AADs, like the, an older version of the UBHS HSM S frame or this Facebook message ranking attack. Um, like using our like building them in Tamarin or modeling them in Tamarin, we could automatically find find the same attacks that were reported before automatically in a matter like of of seconds. Uh, next slide. For uh, we then tested our other approach on also established protocols to just check um, what properties do these protocols actually rely on. So the the things you see here are not actually attacks, most of them, um, but like behavior which may be wanted or not wanted uh, in them uh, that are based on using uh, uh, AADs. So what we could see here is that um, the assigned class in, in this table is a uh, like collision. So all of these protocols rely on some version of collision resistance which, we, uh, which I said before, also entails uh, properties like full commitment or key commitment in our setting. Um, so we reported uh, all of these uh, maybe unwanted behaviors or attacks um, and uh, could perform our complete analysis also uh, in a reasonable time in two hours against all different threat models. So, what do I want you to take away from, from this presentation? First, I think formal methods can be used during protocol design and can actually help to figure out what schemes you might want to use 
and what uh, what schemes could uh, could be needed to actually achieve the properties you want for your protocol. Um, we, but what could help the uh, IRTF is that we had new insights on the actual AAD properties and uh, how they relate with, uh, to each other. And um, our framework like, is also completely automatic and extendable. So if, if there is an error, or if there are future attacks, we can easily incorporate them in our analysis. So thank you and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Andre? Yeah. Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it is very interesting and uh, really important. Uh, I wanted to, well, I know I asked it <laughs> in the email, but uh, I want to ask it here too. Uh, I'm planning to, uh, well, what are your future plans uh, in relation to this uh, study? Uh, and well, uh, the second question, it is not really a question, but uh, I will be really happy if you uh, share uh, well, I use your experience to well, help me building the draft uh, I know you already told me that but uh, mm -hmm. it will be very great mm -hmm. yeah. so um, to, to, to answer the first question um, I uh, well, yeah, we plan to, to focus right now also on other primitives other than AAD but right now, our analysis also, our approach also has still um, limitations we want to address in the future. For example, we right now do not have a way to, to model all the, all the tags perfectly uh, in Tamarin. So there are certain uh, Oracle style attacks um, uh, by which, for example, was the uh, defragmentation attack on SSH, which used uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, the decryption misuse in, in AADs, which we currently cannot uh, model perfectly. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, like uh, have a chat and to, to uh, give input on the, on the uh, draft, um, for sure. Thanks. Any more questions or comments? Okay, thanks. All right, Dimitris. All right. Um, hey, I'm Dimitris, and today I will talk about Mastic, a new verifiable distributed aggregation function, or VDAF. First, I would like to thank my co-authors, Hannah Davis, Christopher uh, Patton, Pratik Sarkar, and Nectar Studios. Next. OK. So Chris already explained uh, what the VDAF is, but let me go over it quickly. So in the VDAF setting, we have multiple clients, and each client has its own private uh, their own private measurement. And on the right-hand side, we have two or more servers, which we will call aggregators. And the idea in the VDAF is that uh, we want to compute an aggregation function uh, in a secure way without revealing anything about the client measurements. Uh, next. And when we talk about aggregation functions, we care about counts, we care about histograms, which are like uh, a count by a different category, uh, or heat maps, with, which are like multidimensional histograms, or even more elaborate statistics, such as heavy hitters. And again, Chris mentioned this before, but uh, in the problem of heavy hitters, essentially we can have uh, each client submitting a very big string, uh, and we want to find the most popular or the heavy um, strings among all the client measurements. Next slide. Um, and many VDAFs rely on what is called the distributed point function or some version of uh, DPF. And a DPF is a very cool tool uh, or primitive that allows a client to secret share uh, a binary tree, next slide, um, without, send, without secret sharing every node of the binary tree. So in this case, we care about uh, a binary tree that's zero everywhere, except for a specific path from the root down to a leaf. And you can see like uh, in the client, we have a path that's all ones. This can be any non-zero values, uh, not just one. So in the DPFs allow the client 
to Secret Share two keys and then expand, and the, then the aggregators can expand on those keys and retrieve the secret shares. And the, the nice part here, the nice property we get is that the keys are significantly smaller than secret sharing the whole binary tree. Next. And now the idea is that if we have multiple clients, each client can secret share uh, the keys that represent their measurement, and the aggregators can expand their keys, retrieve the secret shares, and then aggregate um, all the shares together and compute the VDAF. Next. Um, now, this happens when everyone is honest. And um, let's see what can happen if some parties start acting maliciously. And uh, here we will focus on clients. So the first thing that the malicious client can do is to double vote. And by double voting, we mean that the uh, client will try to create um, a, a binary tree that has a non-zero value or more than a non-zero value in its level. So you can see, for example, level two has two non-zero values. Um, again, this is problematic now for the servers or for the aggregators because they will only see secret shares that represent this binary tree. And there's no easy way for them to detect if what they have, the secret shares that they have uh, are valid or not. Next slide. So um, we call this property one hot verifiability and um, we um, inherit uh, this uh, um, this property from the previous work of uh, Plasma, which introduced a verifiable incremental DPF primitive. Next slide. So in this work, um, the two aggregators can evaluate a specific prefix, and the prefix here can be uh, the string, essentially that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, on the key. So server zero or aggregated zero will uh, evaluate a prefix on key zero and server one, uh, the prefix on key one. And what they will get back are uh, vectors of secret shares for a specific level. So aggregator zero will get the vector y, which, are, which has the secret shares for this level. Uh, and then aggregator one will get the vector z that has also the secret share for that level. Next slide. Uh, additionally, they will get these two pi zero and pi one, these two proofs. Now the one hot verifiability guarantees us that if the two proofs are equal, then uh, adding back or reconstructing the vector for that level, and the y and the z, if we add this back, uh, then this vector is one hot. Next slide. OK, so by using this property, the verifiable incremental DPF, we can uh, detect double voting, and we can guarantee, guarantee this one hot verifiability property. Next slide. Uh, there's another problem now. Uh, so the malicious client can also um, use different non-zero values these are the beta values that I'm showing, different non-zero values in different levels. And also the non-zero values cannot be, maybe like on different paths. So if you see here, uh, this, these are two problems. Although each level has one non-zero value, the non-zero values are different between the levels and they are also not consistent. They are not in the same path. Uh, next slide. So um, we defend against this with what we call uh, path verifiability in Mastic. And the way we do that is that, um, uh, next slide. The way we do that is that we um, use a fully linear proof to, um, to verify that the root, that the secret shares at the root uh, are correct, are valid. Now, a fully linear proof is a, a form of zero knowledge that um, operates directly on secret shares. And I said valid, okay, but what is valid? So the, the valid thing, um, depends on the application that we're, to we're talking about. For example, we might define valid in a specific application as having secret shares of one or zero. Uh, or we can have a, a different application that defines valid as having uh, secret shares of a value beta that is in range zero to 100. And this can be defined easily by an arithmetic circuit. And by using a fully linear proof, the two servers can check that they have valid shares uh, of a beta value without uh, without revealing the, the beta value itself. Next slide. So after we do that, uh, now we have verified that the, the root levels are valid. So how can the next step or step two that I'm showing here is to check that this beta value is propagated down the tree correctly. Uh, the way we can do that is uh, by checking that the reconstructed value at the parent, at the, at the parent node, equals the addition of the reconstructed uh, children values. So uh, as I'm showing here, the y at 
prefix p, the y represents the reconstructed value. So the y at prefix p should be equal to the reconstructed value of the prefix concatenated with the zero, which is the left child, and add it to the y of the prefix concatenated with one, which is the right child. Um, now, this property alone is not sufficient, but in conjunction with the one hot verifiability, we get that if we have beta at, um, at the parent, then only one of the two children can be beta. Not, they cannot have like a, uh, some shares of beta. Uh, and then we can uh, recursively run step two to verify the whole binary tree and, pro and verify that the beta values correctly propagate down the tree. So um, this gives us a, a nice property. Uh, this is unique to Mastic because by doing the FLP at the root level, we can check very different properties. For example, we can do uh, histograms, we can do heat maps, but we can also do heavy hitters. And not just that, we can also do uh, what we call a weighted heavy heater, um, where in each level we have like a table with a beta value and also uh, secret shares of one or zero to, to still do the heavy heaters. Next slide. Okay, by combining these two properties, the one hot verifiability and the path verifiability, uh, we can defend against malicious clients. And we can guarantee that each client can submit uh, uh, a binary tree that is zero everywhere and has only one path from the, the root down to, to a leaf that has uh, beta values. And the, these beta values are the same. Next slide. We have some preliminary results. Um, so here I'm, so, I'm only showing the heavy hitters uh, example. We have not yet implemented the uh, aggregation by labels or these weighted heavy hitters that I mentioned. So this is the plain heavy hitters, but this is using an FLP at the root, but the FLP is uh, only checking if it's zero or one. So um, you can see we have uh, three plots. So in the first one, uh, we, so in, the, in all three plots, we use different thresholds and these thresholds represent what we consider a heavy hitter. So, um, Essentially, the higher the threshold you have, uh, the more uh, the more pruning that you do, and the less heavy hitters that you that you will uh, consider in, the, in your final results. And we can see that um, the threshold does not really affect popular, but we have seen like a, a very interesting speed up in mistake when we increase the threshold. Uh, next slide. So we will work on more evaluations and the full security analysis uh, in a paper that we will publish soon. And um, Again, like uh, we, uh, the, the interesting part that we see here is that we can do both heavy hitters with the same protocol and also histograms or weighted heavy hitters uh, or some aggregations by different labels and all this like with the same protocol. Okay, next slide. All right, uh, that's all I had. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Chris Wood. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if there are uh, any advantages that Poplar offers that Mastic does not. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I cannot fully answer this right now as we have not fully fledged the implementation. Um, so, um, I want to do an apples to um, apples comparison at some point. So, this uh, number that I showed you. In Mastic, we do uh, a proof aggregation that definitely saves us some time. Uh, so we want to see how this will be without this proof, ag proof aggregation and how we, um, what's the problem or what's the overhead when we have multiple malicious clients. I know this is like an application that's very interested, uh, interesting for Chris. And uh, we we need to, to, to see like how, how Mastic um, how, how performant uh, Mastic is in this case. Uh, the nice thing about Poplar is that uh, the, the runtime would not be affected by the number of malicious clients that you have. But in our case, because we do, um, uh, we do a Merkle tree to, to check the malicious clients, uh, if we have multiple malicious clients, then the, the runtime might increase. I'm not sure how much yet, uh, so we need to, to finalize the implementation and run some more experiments, but all this would be included in, in the paper. Yeah, just to kind of 
um, flush that out a little bit. Um, we don't yet have an apples to apples comparison in terms of like uh, CPU time or communication costs or the things that we would care about. Um, I suspect it's going to be like slightly slower if it, when used in the same mode of operation, but the trade-off here is like a much more flexible tool. Yeah, I was mostly interested not in performance, um, yeah. but in like what is the actual functionality that we're gaining as opposed to Poplar. Right? Yeah, Poplar is a subset of what Mastic can do. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm very interested to see what the performance numbers are for the uh, the dealing with malicious clients or whatever. Um, but if it turns out that like this thing is like uh, vastly more general or whatever, more flexible, offers more features, and is like like a modest performance regression. I would suggest just like punting Poplar out of the spec and just going with this. Yeah, I think uh, I'd be down to do that too. Um, I think we would need to figure out if it's it's separate document or the same document. I think either is possible. Um, before we make too many dis rash decisions, I, I want us to do the security analysis and make sure we understand the performance trade-offs better. For sure. Yeah, and uh, keep in mind the comment at the end of the VDAP section about uh, the differing levels of details with regard to Poplar versus Prio in that document. And introducing a new one, um, you should make them consistent. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hubert Cario, and I'll be talking about the RSA guidance uh, document. Uh, so, uh, what we'll talk about is, uh, in general, the blanket uh, deprecation of PKCS1 version 1.5, uh, new improvements to timing side channel attacks, uh, recommendation about uh, most common uh, leakage sources, and uh, about implicit rejection for the KCS1 version 1.5. So uh, basically, I think everybody knows that uh, PKCS1 version 1.5, uh, first shown by Bleichenbacher to be problematic, uh, that was 25 years ago. And uh, we've been getting uh, new problems every few years uh, and newest protocols like TLS 1.3 or uh, Web Crypto already deprecated it. So I think it's mm, uncontroversial. Now, uh, as far as improvements to timing side channels is that most of the research that's published, most of the literature is uh, using the box test by Crosby. And that test uh, assumes uh, independence in measurements. That's not this uh, property that actually happens in practice. And like, even if we consider stuff like turbo boosting in CPU, uh, that, that uh, assumption is fundamentally incorrect. Uh, given that it was incorrect, conclusions from it are also incorrect. Uh, that includes the widely repeated uh, uh, conclusion that uh, side channels smaller than about 100 nanoseconds are uh, not detectable over the network. Uh, Okay, uh, next. So here you can see a um, heat map for uh, detection of the side channel. Uh, on the vertical axis, we have the delta in for, uh, for loop, uh, like the, the server was just counting from given value to zero in a very tight for loop, like just two instructions for uh, x86-64. And as you can see here, uh, like when the difference between the measured and the side channel version is like 1000 uh, cycles, then this is fairly detectable even with just a few hundred probes. But if we go down to a single cycle, which uh, represents uh, I think it was like six or seven clock cycles of, of the CPU, one million probes, you can detect it over the network, uh, no, uh, no problem. This is over uh, re real uh, ethernet uh, gigabit uh, copper. So this kind of measurements are um, uh, as, uh, as possible as you can imagine. Uh, so uh, the solution uh, is to uh, use 
pairwise tests like the sign test, Wilcoxon sign test, and uh, those do not require the, in the, um, the, the same environment uh, for each pair being compared. So like even if we have a, a sample of uh, a million uh, measurements, uh, half of that million can come from one host, the other can come from another host. You can combine those results and uh, have uh, higher confidence in the result, like smaller uh, confidence interval, um, uh, smaller confidence intervals in the in the measurement. Uh, there is also a Friedman test, which allows you to, us to send multiple probes and then compare the whole uh, shebang together, and that gives us even more uh, confidence in the uh, interval. So, general conclusion is that there is no such thing as a timing side channel attack that's uh, not detectable over the network. Okay, so now leakage sources. Uh, multiple libraries assumed that uh, small uh, stuff uh, is not detect uh, detectable, and then, and as such, uh, if you use uh, base blinding for RSA operations, you're fine. Uh, the problem is that if the numerical library assumes uh, uh, does automatic memory management, so uh, small. Um, small value means small memory allocation, uh, that will leak and that will be very detectable. Uh, since high order bits are exactly what we are after in Bleichenbacher, that means that you are vulnerable because you're doing blinding. Um, then uh, again, like if you need to remove uh, blinding, uh, the, the code itself needs to be uh, side channel free, but uh, that, that's also something that we are very familiar with. Uh, now, in general, if we are talking about 64-bit uh, architecture and typical uh, key sizes like 2048, you're mostly fine because uh, the chance of hitting that 64 bits of zeros at the very beginning are fairly low. Uh, the problem is that if you have an implementation that uses smaller values like 54 bits because like you want to have easier handling of uh, carry bits or something like that, or just you're running on 32-bit architecture, then you are again in the um, uh, very easy to uh, attack uh, territory. Uh, same for uh, non-standard key sizes, so 2049 bit, very much easy to attack. Uh, then another problem is bad API design. If you use PKCS1 version 1.5 and you raise an exception uh, in case of padding failure, you have a problem. Uh, now with OAP, that stuff is uh, generally fine, but uh, with PKCS1 version 1.5, you're not. Uh, so M2 crypto, Pyka cryptography, Python RSA, Java in general, Ruby in general, .NET C Sharp, all of that stuff rise an exception. All of them are vulnerable. Uh, same with smart cards. Uh, if the messages exchanged between the smart card and the host are different sizes, then automatically they will also leak that, uh, that situation that, yeah, I've decrypted 200 bytes. This will take more if, if there is an error because that error may take like 64 bytes or something like that. And that difference will also be detect detectable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basic idea uh, to fix this stuff is uh, that we do implicit rejection. So we combine the implicit rejection as implemented in TLS with the deterministic nonce generation as we do for uh, EC DSA. So in TLS, we generate a random value, use it in case of adding error and do, that, do computation with that value for the decryption of the fin uh, final, uh, finished message and so on. Um, with ECDSA, uh, we use the private key and the message to generate a random source of entropy uh, to be able to get the nonce uh, with the, uh, for the signature. Mm. Yeah, next slide, please. So uh, in chosen ciphertext attacks like the Bleichenbacher, the attacker doesn't actually choose the, the, uh, the, the whole uh, ciphertext. Uh, they just multiply it by selected number and then pass it to the oracle. Now the oracle gives the, uh, the attacker information if the uh, ciphertext starts with zeros or not. And uh, then based on that, the attacker knows if, yeah, this is a good guess or, the, or, or a bad guess for the attack. In fact, the, for the PKCS 1.5, 
the attacker is not interested in be or uh, in that padding uh, if in that uh, decryption being valid or not they are only uh, using it as a the proxy information for is the uh, is the value starting with zero or not so with implicit rejection if we are always returning a uh, a message then that whole uh, proxy um, information channel basically disappears because uh, all messages look like they are correct. So the attacker can only assume that all they start with zeros, even the ones that don't, and then the attack doesn't work. Next slide, please. Okay. Huh? Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, questions, please. All right, one from Christopher Patton. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm sort of trying to, I'm sort of trying to like connect this to the, this is about your draft, right? Yes. Yeah. So what do you see as like kind of the function of this draft? Twofold. Uh, one is uh, stop using PKCS 1.5. Great. But uh, we've been telling people to stop using PKCS 1.5 for the past 20 years, and they didn't listen. So I think we really need to provide them with an option that they can, in practice, use. And I think the implicit rejection is that thing. OK, cool. Um, how much overlap is there with this, like the, in, the guidance in this draft? and implementation guidance we would give to other RSA signing algorithms. Is it all about Bleichenbacher, or uh, is there something more we can, more general we, that might be worth doing? It is general. It is general because the thing is, uh, the numerical library uh, side channel comes from before you look at the padding. So it, uh, like if you have a leak from the numerical library, from the uh, deep blinding, that, that will affect uh, OAD and it will affect the raw RSA. So RSA, uh, se uh, secret value encryption, SVE. Okay. And, and is, is your, you wanna, is, is, is the goal to, do you think this is ready for an adoption call? Uh, no, uh, yeah, for adoption call, yeah, I would say so. Bob Moskowitz. Bob Moskowitz, I find this very interesting. I don't know what in the place they're going to do with it. I got, I'm dealing with people with avionics, 25, 30 years old, still doing MD4. <laughs> um, forget about the rest of this. And, and, and how I'm going to wedge this into the discussion there. And, and because it's like, how do we kill the use of RSA and the rest of it? I, 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 I I thank you for this because this may help me uh, in some of these discussions that, that we're having. But this is literally, you say 25 years? Yes, because the avionics are that old and they're not going away. Well, I'm. Until we get new planes. I'm the QE for uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for crypto stuff. So, yeah, I'm well aware of problems of but, but, duplicating but, stuff. <laughs> but again, thank you. This does give me like another discussion point in these discussions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And. Uh, please uh, contact the chairs in the next couple of weeks and we'll discuss bringing this to an adoption call. Um, okay. Taking a look at the queue of upcoming work. Thank you. All right, this is the last presentation. Uh, Debbie. Hello, hello. Um, I'm David Joseph, uh, I'm from Sandbox AQ, and we don't have very much time, so just wanted to make you all aware of this document that we're working on. So it's called Batch Signatures. Um, next slide, please. The, the concept is, um, in the sort of the era of moving towards PQC, we're expecting generally worse performance. We're expecting, you know, as time goes on, generally more traffic. There's always more traffic, more signing requests. Um, can we do anything to improve the situation? Next slide, please. Uh, well, the concept is you build a Merkle tree um, and the leaves are basically your, your transcripts. And at the top, uh, you get a Merkle tree root. You use your you know, favorite uh, 
DSA, your favorite signature algorithm of choice, sign the root, and each signature then becomes the root signature plus the sibling path. So what do we expect from that? Um, generally, there's going to be a small increase in latency because um, you are not only signing, but you're also spending a little bit of time to build the Merkle tree. So there's going to be a very small increase in latency. This is amortized over you know, being able to sign many, many more signatures, uh, sorry, many, many more transcripts uh, for the same signature. And so the actual throughput that you're, you're going to be able to handle is going to be much higher, which in, in pathological scenarios could be quite nice. Um, and yeah, it's not a new idea. Um, there have been many similar constructions in you know, different working groups. There was something very, very similar to this originally in uh, TLS working group from that expired about three or four years ago. Um, there are sort of Merkle tree constructions which are being um, considered maybe in, in DNS. There's Merkle tree certificates. So there's lots of similar things that are kind of you know, around the place. And uh, our hypothesis is that it makes sense to gather this together um, and, and, and you know, bring together some kind of a document in this forum. And so, yeah, this is what it is. If you have any ideas or you'd like to uh, collaborate with us, uh, please get in touch. At the moment, it's uh, uh, a bunch of people from Sandbox. There's also Andreas Holsing involved and, uh, and Martin Albrecht. So um, that's, that's kind of roughly the team. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks, David. Questions? Uh, yeah, thanks for this. Um, just to clarify, this is like generic and not specific to any particular type of signature algorithm, right? Not specific to any particular signature algorithm? Correct. Great. Um, yeah, we have precedent in this group for you know um, specifying like tricks and techniques like this for helping uh, you know various deployment uh, problems. Um, uh, so I'd be supportive of the group working on something like this, um, especially if it might later find its way into TLS or whatever other use cases uh, might be necessary. So uh, thanks for doing it. Um, uh, happy to offer reviews. Thank you. All right. All right. Or still um, awesome. Uh, in the SKIT uh, working group uh, for securing supply chain integrity and transparency, we use a construction, you know, basically exactly like this for our receipts for our transparency log. And that log is based on the um, binary Merkle tree construction in the certificate transparency document. So um, just a sort of word of caution around the construction of the Merkle uh, tree proofs that are going along with it. And there are many different ways to construct them. And there's, a, you know, uh, you probably know this, but, you know, CT has their, their way of doing it. If you want other proof properties beyond consistency and inclusion, um, you, you may need different tree structures. Love to talk with you after. Absolutely, that'd be fantastic. I mean, at the moment, we um, there's some delta on some previous constructions. We move from like collision resistance to target collision resistance. We get some nice properties there. Um, but yes, uh, I would like to talk with you offline. Thanks. I'm also uh, very supportive of pursuing this. I think before we adopt it, though, like in CFRG as a work as a research group item, I would like to see like the engineering work done to prove that for some use case, this is actually better than uh, non-batch signing. Um, I suggested to you the other day, um, we could look at rough time as one thing, because rough time already builds this in. Um, what was the other thing? And then also, um, let's get a sense of whether this actually makes a difference for post-quantum signatures. So I, I, took, I, I, I talked to some random people at my company. Um, they seem to think that we're, comfortable with like the the signatures that we have for the handshake like they're not that much slower they're just really big that's the main problem and i don't know if this really solves that problem absolutely if uh, if anybody has any particularly juicy use cases then also yeah you know please we want use cases um as well to to motivate this work great thank you very much and thanks everyone for attending I think just very quickly, one thing we forgot, 
uh, to mention uh, is one small comment uh, for the end. Uh, our uh, plans for uh, for the nearest future. Uh, we've got two drafts: the the OPRF draft and uh, the Restrator draft that are going to be RFCs uh, in the nearest future. And we are going to start research group last calls for opaque and for CPACE really soon. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, great reviews from the crypto panel. So we hope to start research group last calls really soon. And please try to be involved in this because we really need your comments. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Donislav. And thanks everyone for attending. See you next time. Sure, yeah. Brilliant. I've got a few minutes before the next session. Uh,